Hey, it is that time again for me to talk about what I played last month. Now, this edition of the series is a bit of a weird one because all the games I played in June are ones I've talked about in some capacity recently. The game I spent the most time on was Tears of the Kingdom, which was the focus of May's video, and then the other two games I played were both featured in the indie game recommendation video I did for the main channel. Despite this, I didn't want to skip a month just because I've already talked about these games in other videos, as who knows, there might be people watching this who don't watch everything I put out. Out. That's actually super likely. I also have some new things to say about all of the games that I either forgot to talk about or didn't feel like I had enough time for. So even if you've watched those other videos I've mentioned, the thoughts here should mostly be new ones. So let's get into what I played in June, starting with Tears of the Kingdom. As I said in the May video, when it comes to Tears of the Kingdom, I want to save a lot of my remaining thoughts for other projects, but I did come up with a handful of smaller things in the game that I really liked and don't imagine I will ever focus on in a different video, so here is a list of seven little things about Tears of the Kingdom I found to be really neat. The first is that Link comes to himself while he cooks stuff. It is such a tiny and pointless touch that I love dearly. I forget all the tunes he hums, but he does like the Battle of the Windfish and Zelda's Lullaby, and I just find it to be charming and a nice connecting tissue to the other games. The second thing is the stabilizer. The way this device works is when you hit it, it stands up. I don't know, I just think it has a lot of cool potential uses, the most obvious of which is creating a catapult, something I did a bunch of times. And I hope someone smarter than me makes an awesome elaborate device based around it. Third is that the HUDless option takes Link's hearts off the screen. I love only seeing information when I need to see it, and I really enjoyed not having anything to distract from the world. With that said, there should be more customization options for the HUD. It being all or nothing is not ideal. They could have done a lot better. The fourth thing is that the sound to Lin makes when you use his gust ability is very similar to the bird whistle in Twilight Princess. It's a nice callback and clearly I am a sucker for fan service. Fifth is the minecart shield. It's just a cool fusion that is fun to mess around with. Also, it's a combination I expect a lot of players will run into pretty early on and acts as a good way to show off that there are tons of wild fusions in the game that can be surprisingly useful. Six is skydiving. They really nailed the animations and general feeling of it. Every jump felt exciting and I loved going into the fast dive and just barely landing in what I was aiming for. Very cool stuff. And the last thing I liked is the Stable Trotters rendition of the Stable theme, which is Opponent Song. It's a beautiful version of a classic Zelda tune, and I love that it does the Terrytown thing of having the song change as you bring in more members. Yeah, that's a good list for now. Moving on, once I rolled credits on Tears of the Kingdom, I replayed the Swapper in order to have footage of it for my main channel video, and revisiting it was a lot of fun. While it wasn't the first indie game I ever played, it was one of my earlier exposures to them, so I have a bit of a soft spot for it. Its core gimmick is that you make copies of yourself that you can move your consciousness between. The clones mimic your movement, but only the version that you are actually controlling can collect the orbs you need in order to progress. The main obstacle you have to figure out how to work around are the different colored lights that limit your powers in various ways. The blue lights don't allow you to create clones within them, the red lights don't let you transfer your consciousness through it, and the purple lights don't allow you to do either. There are so many rooms in this game that you'll walk into, see the light patterns, and think this is impossible, which makes actually figuring it out feel incredible. In general, I think clones are a really good mechanic for a puzzle game, and there aren't enough titles that use them, so I find myself thinking about this game often. In my main channel video, I talked a bit about the story, and got a bunch of comments saying that it kind of has Soma vibes. And yeah, it 100% does. I think if you like Soma's narrative, then you'll find a lot of stuff to like here as well, even though it isn't nearly as story focused. It also explores the idea of swapping consciousnesses in a different way than Soma, which is nice too. But yeah, it's a classic indie game that I think has mostly been overshadowed by its contemporaries. So if you haven't given it a shot yet, you know, consider it. The last game I played in June was Cassette Beasts, a title that takes a good chunk of inspiration from Pokemon, but distinguishes itself in a bunch of notable ways. Interestingly enough, I had finished writing the script for my indie game recommendation video when I started playing Cassette Beasts, but after an hour of trying it out, I knew I had to add it to the list because I was enjoying it so much. One regret I have about the way I pitched the game in that video is I mostly only talked about the combat, which is worth focusing on as it does some interesting things with type matching 
matchups and monster fusions, but there is a ton of other cool stuff about cassette piece that I neglected to bring up. So I want to touch on some of that here. Arguably the biggest thing to note is that it's an open world game. Similarly to most open world games, there is a loose progression path players will most likely follow due to the layout of the world and the fact that certain areas have higher leveled enemies. But unlike most open world games, you don't have to complete the main objectives in a specific order. On your journey, your primary goals will be battling rangers who are this game's equivalent to gym leaders, uncovering train stations that house the bosses who hold the secret of the island, and helping out your companions with various personal quests. You are free to do these things pretty much whenever you want. Like there's a ranger you're intended to fight first and a different one you're intended to fight last, but you theoretically can fight them in any order you want. All in all, I think the structure of how it uses its open world is solid. It gives enough guidance to give players a satisfying sense of progression, but also gives them a ton of freedom to explore the areas that intrigue them the most and take on any challenge they come across, even if they're underleveled. Also, if you've actually been watching this video and not just listening to me talk while you have it playing in a different tab or second monitor, you've probably noticed that the monsters actually roam around the world itself. I love this choice because I much prefer combat being triggered by me running into something than a random encounter. It allows you to feel in control of your experience, making running around the world feel a lot better because you aren't being stopped out of the blue. What makes exploring even more fun is that capturing certain monsters gives you abilities you can use out of combat. This not only incentivizes catching as many beasts as possible so that you can get all of the abilities, but it also gives you new ways to engage with the world, whether that be reaching areas that would otherwise be inaccessible or solving puzzles. You can also use some of these abilities to help out with combat. For instance, there's a dash you can get, and if you run into an enemy while using it, they take a bit of damage at the start of the fight. Overall, it's a cool mechanic that brings together combat and exploration in a neat way. Yeah, that's most of what I wish I had covered in the main channel video, and hopefully it gives you a fuller picture of what the game has to offer. Anyway, that's all I've got for this video. June was a pretty hectic month for me, which made it hard to spend all that much time playing games, so sorry that this selection is a bit light. It should be better next month, though. See you next time, unless I decide to stop doing this.